Here's the first step in your journey into becoming an oil painter. Hey, I'm Jessica Russo Cher. I'm an artist and art teacher, and I'm here to teach you everything you need to know about beginner oil painting. I've been oil painting for many years, and I've learned a lot about the process. I've also been teaching students how to do oil painting. My goal with this video is to teach you the absolute initial steps for getting you into doing oil painting with necessary steps that you can advance and eventually like be incredible in oil painting. So this isn't going to be a dumbed down tutorial on here's the basics that you need to know. It's more here's the first step in your journey into becoming an oil painter. And I do think that still life painting gives me a good setup for teaching this tutorial. But by all means, you could apply this to any subject matter. You do not have to apply these steps to painting a still life because, you know, sometimes painting still lives can be a little boring. Art supplies are expensive. So here are my suggested supplies. I'm using these brand paints because they are the ones in my classroom and this video is primarily for my students. In my Amazon storefront, you see all the paints that I prefer to paint with myself, but for a classroom, these are great. So these are the colors that I recommend as a starter palette. Titanium white, a good solid cadmium yellow or medium yellow, a yellow ochre or like a raw sienna, a cool red and a warm red, ultramarine blue, um, burnt sienna and burnt umber are my basic paints. Of course you could get other paints. So you want to start off oil painting, but it is a bit of a financial investment, especially when it comes to paintbrushes. Paintbrushes can be so expensive, but I have a few tips and suggestions on where you can cut corners and where you can't cut corners. So there's all different types. Basically oil painting brushes are hog bristle, or sable. The hog bristle is a little rougher, the sable is a little bit smoother, and they're natural, so they don't disintegrate in the chemicals that we use in oil painting. However, you can use other paint brushes, like for acrylic, but just know that it's not going to handle the turpentine and they might get gummy and stiff after a while. So you have to understand that if you do buy some cheaper paint brushes, that they might not last. I tend to use actually a lot of acrylic, synthetic acrylic brushes for my oil paintings. I, and I like painting with softer brushes in my oil paintings. And sable brushes, they cost a fortune. So that's where I cut some corners and it works for me. You have to do what works for you and your budget. Paint brushes also come in all different types of shapes and sizes, you know, maybe you want to use rounds or filberts, which are the curvy ones at the top. You want to use more flat brushes or chisel tips. There's all different types of, of ones and you have to kind of find which ones work best for you. I tend to use a combination of these shapes. Next, you need a thinner. I prefer to use an odorless turpentine, but there are lots of other options like Gamsol or Turpenoid out there. This is used to thin your paint and also to clean your paint brushes. This might be my favorite oil painting supply. It seals up your turpentine so you're not breathing unhealthy fumes when you're not painting. It's got this little grid thing on the bottom that helps for two things. It helps keep all of the dirty particles at the bottom and it also helps you clean your brush. So when you wipe on it, it, it cleans it. It also uh, lifts out so you can clean it. I clean mine very rarely because one, it's gross, but it also just stays down there. I like to use a three-part medium of DeMar varnish, linseed oil, and turpentine. However, when I'm teaching my students, we tend to use liquid because we're in a class setting and the navigating three-part medium can be a little bit crazy. We're constantly trying to pour it in something. Liquid works very well being poured onto the palette. It stays moist, stays wet, it st stays liquefied for a little bit, so it's easy to use. It also helps dry the paint a little bit quicker. It's got a bit of a quick dryness active ingredient in it so the paint is a little bit more set up the next class for oil painting you have to work on a primed canvas or a prime surface of some sort 
or else the oil in the paints will eat away at the canvas. I'm just using a simple pre-stretched canvas for this demonstration. You can add acrylic on top of oil paint because oil and water don't mix. However, you can put down acrylic first and then add oil paint on top of it once it is fully dry. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm adding a underpainting to tone my canvas. And I like to do this for all of my paintings because it does influence the colors that I put on top of it. I kind of want to do a warmer underpainting to kind of balance the cool tones of the, the blue in the still life. I'm using a sponge to quickly apply it over the edges and I'm actually going to use the sponge for my second coat of my um, underpainting just to make sure it's nice and evenly spread. I prefer to work on a glass palette but in a classroom setting I tend to use these disposable palettes because they're very easy to use and we get a lot of wear out of them. It also makes cleanup a lot easier for the students and I don't have to worry about oil paint ending up in the sink or anything. Always squeeze your tubes from the bottom. They will get chunky and start oozing out the top no matter what you do. It is just the nature of oil paints. They get gross on the top. It doesn't matter. You just have to deal with it and try to make sure that your lids are closed properly so it doesn't dry out. I tend to lay out my paints in a sort of rainbow-ish order just because it it makes sense when I'm mixing paint to have similar colors near each other. So I tend to do like warms on one side, cools on the other and set it up. But set up the palette whichever way you feel it, it makes sense. Just for the sake of this demo, I'm using my terps in a small cap just so you can see when I'm dunking my brush in them. Now I quickly sketched out my still life. If you're interested in how to draw a still life, I have other tutorials on that, videos on still life drawing but I looked at it mainly for the shapes and where the highlights and shadows were and just tried to block in almost like a coloring book of where I am going to paint. Have you ever heard of fat over lean? No, it's not like a body positivity movement or anything. It is how you need to paint with oil paint. Fat means that there's more linseed oil in the paint. As I'm working, I start off with thin washes, move on to straight oil paint or a little bit more oil paint, maybe a tiny bit thinned with turpentine. Then I use a little bit of liquid in with my paint. And then I will add a little bit more liquid and I can create glazes with that. I typically start with just black or rather just Burnt Umber and Ultramarine Blue because I don't use black paint. To do this, I'm using a synthetic acrylic brush. Uh, it's a round brush, but you know what? Whatever, it works for me. And then I mix in a little bit of turpentine in with that to create a wash. Basically, I'm trying to set the darkest values of my painting in, and I'm doing this with thin washes. So there's a lot of turpentine in here and I'm just going to lay it in in the main areas, just trying to figure out where those dark shadows and shapes will be. In the shadow area, I wanna apply that with more of a dry brush. So I will remove a lot of the paint from my brush and just sort of scumble it onto the surface. So this stage is called blocking in. I've blocked in my dark values, now I'm blocking in my lighter values. Um, not working quite as thin as my previous layer, but it's still fairly translucent. I, I still can see a lot of the underpainting coming through this layer. Now that my light and dark values are in, I'm going in for some mid-tones. So I want to go into the shadows and I the shadows in my still life, I can see there's some warmer areas and cooler areas. So I'm starting with the cooler areas, especially since my underpainting has a lot of warm tones. And for this, I'm just adding ultramarine blue, burnt umber, and titanium white. 
And now that I have the majority of those areas locked in, I start going back and forth between my lighter values and my darker values and my midtones and just start painting the whole thing. Uh, this, this blocking in point helps me really understand my value scale, the degree of light and darkness of my painting and the color relationships. I'm ready for some liquid. This will help add more uh, transparency to the paint a little bit but also a little bit more fluidness and thickness to the paint as I'm working and in this way I end up with a little bit more control it also helps me blend the paint a little bit more you can pour liquid in a separate little container or you can pour it directly out onto the palette it is completely up to you if it's not mixed up all the way, it will come out kind of too liquidy. So you wanna make sure that it is um, well integrated so it doesn't just kind of slop out all over the place. So the way you use medium is that you just uh, dip your brush in it and mix it into the paint as you're using it and um, trying to get a balance between the paint and the medium and this balance just takes a little bit of time to get used to you know what you like the preference you have for how much of the medium you're using so now i'm working with fatter paint over leaner paint fat takes a lot longer time to dry than the lean so if you can imagine if we have a lean layer on top of the fat. The fat is still wet and the lean layer dries. It can cause cracking. It can cause, especially if you're working quite thick, it can cause these sort of, I like to call it pudding skin. Imagine on your palette, like as oil paint starts to dry, it might get crusty on the outside, but still wet on, when you poke it with your paintbrush. You can get that on your painting. That's not a good thing for your painting and the longevity of your oil paint. So do your best to try to follow these patterns. Blocking in with a wash, oil paint, oil paint with some medium, gradually increasing your use of the medium throughout, and then glaze. Now that I have the majority of the painting blocked in and the shapes established, I can start adding details, like trying to figure out where the ferrule, the metal part of the paintbrush is, and the highlights and the reflections, and trying to make sense of how one brush is over here and the other brush that's next to it, because right now they're just kind of like mushed together. I periodically clean my brush in the little turpentine well that I have and I use a piece of paper towel or scrap piece of cloth to dry off and wipe off my brush every so often. And it's at this point that I, I need to spend a little bit more time on the background and the table to really get the right color values uh, and make sure that they, they blend in to it makes sense in the overall scene and i'm working much thicker now you can see there's actual texture slight impasto to the paint that i'm using uh, you don't have to work this thick this is just something that i wanted to do to kind of add to the overall texture of the painting and create a little bit more contrast between the background and the cast shadow now this step is very crucial. I need to shuffle my podcast so I have the perfect inspiration for while I am painting. For this demonstration, I'm working flat on a table with my palette next to me. Uh, full disclosure, I never usually paint this way. I usually paint with my work up on a on a easel so I could step back and look at it. But so at this point, you probably can notice that I'm working all around the painting. I'm not just focused on one area because I prefer to understand how everything works together and kind of build it up from the bottom to the top.
for the majority of the rest of this, I'm just going through and repeating a lot of those same techniques over and over again till I build up the layers and I get the colors the right way and the brush strokes the right way and have it come together as a unified painting all at once. So I'm just going to kind of do a lot of um, quick uh, time lapse so you can kind of see the process as a whole. I'm using a fairly thin brush for this and uh, sometimes I take the brush and I swirl it around so it, the point of the bristles come a little bit more pointier so I can get a little bit more detail. Now on to glazing, and this means that I use a lot more of the liquid. So this is fatter paint, and I can add layers on top of the colors I already have. So you can see me adding a warmer, I mean, yeah, a warmer shadow in, but it's not influencing any of the colors that are underneath. And that's because the painting has fully dried. Uh, well, okay, it's dried for about two weeks. It's dried to the touch, and I can add layer upon layer of glaze on top to help add depth to the values, to the colors, and make the painting even more dynamic than this very dynamic still life already is. Um, but glazing is my favorite part of painting by far because it really takes the painting to the next level. Here you can see where I'm adding blue and then I'm going in with a dry brush and like scrubbing it in and blending it out so it creates just a thin layer of a color on top and really makes the painting sort of pop. Here you can kind of see my whole setup and how I move back and forth between the palette and the painting. And I, although my palette looks a little bit crazy right now, it's dry in a lot of places. I'm constantly drying off my brush or grabbing dry brushes to slowly blend in the glaze layers. Right now I'm blending it in on the vase to make the highlight, mid-tone, deep shadow, and reflected light look more gradual and stand out a little bit. Now it's just a lot about moving around the painting, blending out the areas that I want to be a little softer and the areas that I want to have a little bit more detail. I wanna bring up this division between the background and the table, kind of creating a little bit of a cast shadow underneath there to add a little bit more structure and depth to the painting. And I am using a little bit of liquid in with paint, but it is slightly more oil paint because I do want some sort of opacity. However, with the liquid in it, it allows it to be wet enough that I can easily blend it into the other layers that are there. Now I should say that since I'm using liquid, it does have a drying agent in it. So it does set up and dry faster than if you're using a three-part medium of linseed oil, Damar varnish, and turpentine. And that helps speed up the process when you're working in a classroom setting, but it also helps speed up the process of adding details like this. So the majority of my glaze has dried at this point, and now I'm going in and adding those small little dots of paint, literally paint, on the paintbrushes, and kind of smoothing out and blending in all the values so they all come together. And just when I think I'm done, I'm actually going in with an X-Acto knife here. I know that sounds a bit ridiculous, but I'm not pressing very hard. What I'm trying to do is add, you know, it's a small painting with lots of small details. Those small hairs on the bristles on the brushes are very hard to paint with a small brush. And I can get a little bit more of a crisper indent and scrape into the paint a bit on both the bristles and the ferrule to kind of sharpen and add more detail. This is not something I do on most of my paintings, but it is something that you can do if you are looking. This also works for like painting hair and things like that if you want to scrape into it uh, like a scrivito. After I finish this process, I am looking at it and I feel like it just doesn't have quite enough depth in the shadows. So I go and add this cronacridone sort of violet looking, which is actually lucerne crimson with a little bit of ultramarine blue blended in, in a glaze. And you can see how I'm using my dry brush to pull it out, to blend it in. 
Now, as you learn more, these steps can develop and branch off and you can do it in a lot of different ways. Because there are some specific rules for oil painting, but you, depending on the subject matter, the scale, the overall understanding of the piece, it can really develop. Here you can see I'm still working on the glazing of the shadows, trying to get the depth as accurate as possible. And with that, I sometimes have to bring up the contrast between the background and the table again. And so a lot of this is just balance. But nevertheless, these are the stages of painting and oil painting and how to layer the paint so you can have very interesting, deep, dynamic oil paintings. And now that the painting's done, wipe your brushes on your paper towel or cloth and then give them a swirl. If you have one of these containers, it's great because you can just rub it along the bottom of the grate. I like to do this sort of collectively and individually, as you can see. So it kind of lets some of them soak as I clean them more individually. Then dry them off on some paper towels to get rid of all of the excess oil paint uh, and turpentine. There's a couple ways I like to wash my brushes, uh, oil painting brushes mainly. So after they've been washed in turpentine and kind of like all like this, then I use a little bit of soap and water. I put the soap in my hand and then I swish it around in the palm of my hand. Uh, maybe you don't want to get the chemicals on you. That's okay. You don't have to do this. Uh, I like to do this because I like to uh, actually work it into the bristles to kind of get it a little cleaner. I also have this thing. It's actually a Bob Ross thing and you put it in your sink and basically what you're doing is running the water on and you can go like that over your brushes and that helps get them clean. Then I give them a nice wash. And then you can use like a brush conditioner, something like this. And this is really good if your brushes are really crusty. This can help bring them back to life. And I usually just work with a handful of brushes at a time and just give it a little swirl. If my brushes are really crusty, I will let them sit with this on for a little bit, kind of like a hair mask, you know? And then, give them a little rinse, dry them off so that the glue in the ferrule, this metal part, doesn't get all um, destroyed. And style their little hairs up there so they look all nice. And that's it. So I hope this tutorial helps walk you through the steps of oil painting and get to know a little bit more about the process. Of course, you can do this in a lot of different ways, like I said earlier, but these are some of the techniques that I feel are the basics, but also giving you the best stepping stone to move on to create your own work. If you really enjoyed this content and found it helpful, please not only subscribe and like and do all those things, give me comments, feedback, Thanks for watching and uh, enjoy the process.